Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Jess Hilarious, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. His 17th season on air, ladies and gentlemen. Steve Wilkos, welcome back. Oh, Hello. Thanks for having me again. How are you? I'm great. Where'd you coming from? Connecticut. Oh, okay, so it wasn't that long. No, that I far. mean, you know, it's not great, but as long as the car's moving, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. You're celebrating your 30th year in television, like on television. I know you, you started as um, Jerry Springer's bodyguard. Yeah. And um, actually, the producer on the Jerry Springer show, right? What's Did you produce the? You, no, you no, were no, a producer no, on no, it? no, no, no. I seen your name in the credits I, on a couple of them episodes. Well, on my show, I'm an executive producer. Absolutely, I yeah, know that. But, but I that's don't. I don't produce. That's just uh, <laughs> you know they give you the title because yeah. if my show ever won an Emmy, if I was an executive producer, I want to get an Emmy. Mm. That's why they do it. So I mm. have nothing to do with the producing of the show. But okay. um, I started on the Spring Show. I was a Chicago cop. Yeah. Oh, okay. They just hired some cops to do security, and I happened to be one of them. And thirty years later, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you ever yeah. expect your career to end up like? No, this? I was going to be a policeman. Like my my dad was a Chicago policeman for thirty years, and mm. he retired, and that's what I was going to do. You know, just be a cop, get my pension, and retire. But mm. I kind of liked the way it worked out. So yeah. you didn't retire on a job. You no, I had twelve years, and 12 I could have got a pension, but I pulled it, and you know, just uh, twelve years was long enough. Actually, did you have to really contemplate like? Do I leave this where I could go, or do I wait 12 years, I get my pension, well, it I'm, was, I'm good it, for the rest of my life? It was difficult because, you know, when I left, I had no idea. I left in 2001, and I got my show in 2007, so I never knew I was going to get my own TV show. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was crazy to even to think. But um, my wife, who's my executive producer, and she became the executive producer, Jerry Springer, I actually came home one night, and I was covered in blood in my police uniform. And she goes, this is crazy, man. You need to, you know. She And she said, listen, when the Springer show's over, we're not staying. We're living on your policeman's salary. She goes, I'm a TV producer. We're going to go to L.A. or New York, and I'm going to be a TV producer, and you'll find something to do. And I said, yeah. And at that point, I was kind of burnt out being yeah. a policeman. You know, mm -hmm. I was tired of fighting and everything and getting hurt. So I was like, okay, I'm okay with that. When did you really start making money? At 30 years in TV, at what point did you really start uh, making money? So in 94, when I started, I was like uh, an hourly guy. Mm -hmm. Then the next year, they, they wanted me there, so I was a, a week. I got weekly pay. And then I think it was 97, they gave me a contract for $75,000. Mm -hmm. So that's a part-time job, you mm -hmm. know, and I was making, I think, 45000 as a policeman. And then um, the next year, they like not even the next year, it was like six months later, they tore the contract Contract up and they gave me one hundred fifty thousand because the show was wow. skyrocketing, and, and uh, so I honestly thought I was like the richest guy in the world, making one hundred fifty thousand dollars yeah. part time job, and uh, so I guess that was when it really started. And then after that, then it kept climbing, and then I was when I got my own show, I started making really good money. Mm -hmm. now, now you're the second longest running syndicated daytime talk show in in, in current production. Jesus. And I wish all those people that laughed in my face in L.A. when I did the media tour, like, they were just dogging me, man. Like, Jerry Springer's guy, he's not going to last 13 weeks because back then it was 13-week pickups. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they're like, you're not going to last 13 weeks. And I'm like, okay, we'll see. And, you know, 30 years in TV straight with never missing a paycheck is unheard of. Mm. So what's the key to the success, though? Like, what, and our two questions, a two-fold question. What's the key to success? And what did you learn for, learn from Jerry? Because he had a long career yeah. as well. Uh, you know, I, I, I and I, I, I'm not trying to sound like, you know, like I didn't learn anything from Jerry, but there was nothing to learn from Jerry's show because mm -hmm. we do a completely different show, right? Mm -hmm. um, what I, I There's a lot of things I learned from Jerry, like being professional, showing up on time, being always ready. And and he said, hey, man, when you go, don't, don't try to be like me or the show. Just do your own thing mm -hmm. and you'll be fine. The really secret of my success is my wife, and mm -hmm. and I say that, and I'm you know I'm not just a husband saying it about his wife, you know if it wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't be sitting here right now, mm -hmm. and that's the truth because, um you know I went I had my problems about six years ago I had DUI and mm -hmm. you know all that like, she stuck with me through that pulled me out of it you know I I, I was going through things and and but even like she knows how to produce me on my show she knows how to do a lot of things. She kept the Springer show on the air for a lot of years. So I got the best executive producer on TV. Yeah. So 
truthfully, and she and she knows me. She lets me be me. The first two years of my show were terrible. I was produced in a way that was just. I hated doing the show. I literally hated coming to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they, that person left, and my wife took over. And thank God, because yeah. I wouldn't. I definitely would not be on there. Thank God for nepotism. <laughs> That's right. I'm not mad at it. No, they did not want to give my wife the show so, oh. because she was the EP of Springer. Mm-hmm. You know, when this, mm-hmm. when Richard Dominic left the Springer show, they promoted my wife's EP. They did not want to make her the EP of my show too. So. They said, we're not giving you your wife as DPI. I said, okay. So they brought in a guy. Uh, I think he was on like Blind Date or Cheaters or something. I can't mm-hmm. remember. And they said, we'd like you to interview this guy. And if you like him, you know, we're going to give this guy to Sean. I said, okay. So this was a process of like a month, like bringing him in, going to dinner with them. I said, fine. I like him. He's, you know, he's okay. You know, wasn't bad, wasn't good, but kind of vanilla. But I said, okay, I can work with him. Well, during the meantime, my wife's doing my show. The ratings are going like this, second okay. season, you know. And uh, so I'm like, damn, man, you know, kind of want her. But, uh, you know, they were saying, no, no, no. So this guy ended up turning the offer down, mm. the guy that I interviewed. He's like, no, nah, I'm not taking it. So I tell the president, uh, I go, hey, man, so what's the story here? Like, this guy doesn't want the job. My wife's doing it, and the ratings are. He goes, yeah, okay, we're going to give you your wife. And that was it. Oh, That's his okay. Yeah. So she's yeah. the key to the success then, clearly. She's a huge, huge part of it. Word. Did you guys ever um, have like any fallouts about you not wanting, you know, of, of course. We used to fight about point. things. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was like, she would do shows, especially there was shows like with kids and stuff, you know, and I hated doing those. I just, yeah, I don't know what it is. I don't like it. I feel like I can't relate to kids. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not going to lie. And But my wife's like, just do it, you know. And... They would work, and she was right. So, like, at this stage of my career, I just, even if I don't like it, I just keep my mouth shut. You just learn to shut up. I just do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because those I'm were like, it'll be over episodes. in 20 minutes, and why complain? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, last week you reported uh, that Steve Wilkos was in uh, Jess with the Mess, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you had um, taken a social media because you watched the, the Wendy Williams. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you were actually the first celebrity that spoke up, besides myself, spoke up, you know, in favor of her about you know, her treatment and how yeah. they made her look on the documentary. Like, and I just, you know, wanted to know in person, you know, how well, you felt. Well, you know, me and when, like when I was launched, I, I was, I did Wendy's radio show and she was so nice to me. Yeah. And, uh, and then she launched right after me, I think the year after me. And so I would always appear on a show and I had a personal relationship with Wendy. I mean, I went to her 50th birthday party and things like that. And, you know, I saw her and I really, I really liked Wendy. I, yeah. you know, Jenny, I, and I don't watch daytime talk show, but I, I would watch her show. I thought it was really good. I was interested in it. And I liked the Hot Topic segment and all that. Um, so I, I I really cared about Wendy, you know? Mm-hmm. So then to show her in that, in this, you know, and we were, to the, we, where was I? I was, uh, oh, I was in Florida. And we were flipping through me and my wife in the hotel, and I started watching. I'm like, oh, my God, this is terrible. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think like when when I was going through my struggles and you know uh, at my lowest, if there was a camera in my house filming me, mm. like no, but my wife would never allow that to happen to me. Yeah, you know she'd be like, no, they we're never doing anything like that. And um, so it's just because you know, especially as a woman, right? Mm. What woman wants to see her wig being like yeah. taken off and shown mm. in that light or her? They're showing her feet. She's got that some kind of problem with her feet and. Yeah. You know, come on, man. If she was in her right state of mind, she would never let anybody never see her do that. And she's obviously suffering from alcohol, uh, you know, being alcoholic or a drinking problem. And, you know, when you're going through something like that, I don't think you should be on camera. And that manager's like, oh, uh, we're going to do a podcast with Wendy, and she's she's ready. She's, like, she's not ready to do anything, man. Mm-hmm. Come on, mm-hmm. you know. And she should be in a treatment facility somewhere getting medical attention from doctors and everything else. And... It just, to me, it was really uh, exploitative. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, you know, people are blashing back at me like, well, you know, when you talk crap about her TV show, I go, she's not showing anybody in their deepest and filming them. Like, yeah. what are you talking about? You know, it's a TV show, you know? Yeah. It's so crazy to me how people can cheer the downfall of another human being. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I, especially I in these times, you know, people have been so 
desensitized. Like they've become so desensitized from like actual problems, and and, and they're not able to separate human being from, mm -hmm. you know, Wendy Williams, the the media personality, you know, and because she she would ask the questions that people wouldn't ask, she would get in the business, but that was her job. Yeah, that was you know exactly. So, yeah. Well, and then the other thing was people were like, well, she's the executive producer of that Lifetime thing, and I go. If you're not in your right mind, you can't right. consent. You know, right. like people don't understand that. Like, you know, if you're suffering a mental breakdown, you can't mm -hmm. really, you're not going to go into a legal binding contract for anything. So. When's the last time y'all spoke? Uh, well, I think I was on her show. Uh, well, I hosted her show uh, with Jerry when she was on, on the break, and I spoke to her just before that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, she was struggling at that time. And, and I, I told her, I said, hey, listen, anytime you want to talk to me, because I've been through it. And she knew it, and we talked about it off stage the last last time I appeared on the show with her. So, you know, it's just tough. And yeah. and how did you get through, because you said you had a DUI, how did you get through your troubles during that time? I, you know, listen, I was drinking too much. and uh, Was it stress? Was it Stress, too depression, much? anxiety. I was using alcohol to help with depression, and which is probably the last thing in the world you should do. You can afford a driver, Steve. I could. It's, yeah. Listen, I make no excuse. I, I I can't tell you why I drove that day or what made me get in my car and get in it. I'm absolutely wrong. And I knew like my life could have changed for a lot worse that day other than just going to do I could have killed somebody or mm -hmm. could have killed mm -hmm. myself. And uh, I just said, I'm not drinking anymore. Now, a lot of people can't do that, just say, I'm not going to drink anymore. But uh, I knew it was becoming a problem in my life, and I was going to ruin everything in my life, my family, my career. And I just said, okay, I, I no, you know, I'm not 20 years old anymore. I got to take this serious and stop, and I did. So when did it happen? Since? What's that? Yeah, so you haven't drank since? Since 2018 was the last oh, time wow. I had mm. drank. Yeah. Nice. Where did it happen at? In my town, Darianne. That's what I'm saying. They didn't give you no Steve Wilco celebrity privilege? Like, <laughs> Well, when you're involved in an accident like I oh, was, that, okay, and okay, they okay. had to take me to the hospital, gotcha. they had to draw my blood. So there was no taking care of me. Gotcha. You know? yeah. And truthfully, listen, nobody wants a DUI, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants, and especially when you're in our position, you know, it's on TMZ and you get blown up. But truthfully, it was probably the best thing for me because it made me, and listen, now that I don't drink anymore, I'm very productive. I work out all the time. Um my marriage is great. My career is great. And, you know, alcohol was really negatively impacting all those aspects of my life, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I was honest about it. I mean, like, you know, I wanted to fight it so bad because yeah. you know, I started drinking when I was 14 years old. And, you know, to give up a lifetime habit like that's not easy. But I knew. And now when I look back, I go, why in the world did I ever drink? Like, mm. you know, but... A lot of people do it. I mean, it's fun. It's not yeah, like, it is. Come on. Yeah. It is. Yeah. <laughs> the best times. You got to do it responsibly, but it's fun. The best <laughs> times in my life were drinking. Absolutely. You know, so, mm -hmm. yeah. What do you say to people, because uh, when you think about Wendy Williams and how they showed her situation on television, but, you know, uh, God bless the dead, Jerry Springer, like people didn't even know he had uh, cancer. So what do you say to people who feel like celebrities have an obligation to show you the bad since you've seen all the good. Jerry, Jerry didn't even tell me he had cancer, yeah, right? Yeah. Like a month before he passed away, uh, he called me up and said, hey, because um, he had nothing going on in Stanford mm -hmm. at the time. You know, uh, Judge Jerry was over everything. Yeah. So he called me up and he said, hey, uh, you want to, I'm having dinner with all his old guys, his crew, the security, because they all work on my show. And I, and I was taping that day. And I said, Jerry, I don't want to go to dinner with 20 guys and, when I'm done taping, I'm exhausted at the end of my tape day because I'm doing like six stories a day. So I said, you know, I'm going to pass. And he goes, I really want to see you, Steve. Well, Jerry, you know, doesn't talk like that. You know, mm -hmm. I really want to see you. So I said, I'll tell you what. You go to dinner. I'm going to go home, re rest a little bit. And then I'm, when you're done, you go meet me for a cigar. at John, John Starks has a place in Stanford, Connecticut, cigar bar. So I met him there. And... It was crazy because we were two guys that never talked about the glory days. Like, oh, you know, remember this, remember that. We didn't do that. He has a grandson, uh, and my son is about the same age, and they're both athletes. And we would always talk about our sons. Or we, and we talked about politics a lot and just what was happening currently in our lives. We never talked about the glory days. Mm -hmm. But that night, we talked a lot about the glory days, which mm -hmm. I, I didn't think anything of at the time, and it was kind of fun because we never do it. And But he never said, hey, Steve, by the way, I'm gonna, I'm dying. 
pancreatic cancer. Wow. And never mentioned it. But I knew something was wrong because I said, Jerry, like, you okay? You know, because he was like shaking really bad and stuff. And he goes, no, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. And that's the kind of guy he was. He didn't even want to put that burden on me. You know, like, I, because I would. I'd be sad and depressed and worried yeah. about the guy. And, and so we had a great time and he got up, hugged me. I love you, Steve. And I was like, well, I love you too, Jerry. Of course I love you. And, and that was it. And I, you know, then a month later he passed away. So wow. um, I think he, you know, that's the kind of guy Jerry was. I don't think he wanted to have people make a big deal about him. He, he didn't want to burden people with his illness. Um, and so, yeah, I respect it. But again, just like with the Wendy Williams thing, when you're at your lowest, you know, and I think we've all been there, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, I don't think you want a camera on you when you're going through that. No. Simple as that. How have you dealt with his death? Uh, you know, kind of like- It hasn't been a year yet, right? Uh, no, it's uh, in April. April. It's coming up. Um, it was almost like losing my father. I, I, and I always say, no man had a personal interest in me and, w- w- you know, kind of watching out for me, being there for me, than my own father- and so we were very close, and, and Jerry was so great to me and uh, so generous and caring. And, you know, so, yeah, I mean, it was a big loss in my life. Yeah. What yeah. was your craziest show from the Jerry Springer show? Something that was just so wild. You were like, <laughs> Which is my favorite drop of water in the ocean. Um, <laughs> uh, it really, it's just a million of them. I, it, just a funny story, like, uh, he was coming out with his movie Ringmaster. Uh, I think it was like, this was 1988, 1999, something like that. And he had came to me and he said, hey, Steve, uh, I have to take my shirt off in the movie. So would you mind working out with me a little bit? I just want to lift enough so you know I don't look terrible. <laughs> and I said, okay, we'll start weightlifting. Well, we had this big fight on stage. It was two women fighting. And I had bent down to like break them up. And my groin just snapped in half. Like, whoosh. I felt like somebody shot me. I actually thought somebody pulled out a gun and shot me. Jeez, and That's how bad it was. Jesus. In my groin. And I like I didn't know what was going on. And I crawled off backstage. I couldn't stand up and I mm. crawled. And and a lot of people didn't even notice because the fight was going on. And I'm backstage and I, I turned over. I threw up on the floor and all of a sudden Jerry comes walking. He he looks down at me, he goes, Are we working out tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, damn, Jerry, I'm dying over here. What what, what happened? Did you? Go I, to the I doctor? tore my groin and they mm. took to the hospital and like I was all black and blue down there. It's just a freak injury. It just yeah. happened, yeah. yeah. So, but it's pretty painful. Did it take a little while for things to get back working? Right, yeah, right down there. I mean, it was black and blue, man. Jesus I mean, Christ. like somebody hit me with a baseball bat down there. Jesus, it was, it was nuts. You couldn't get hard. Was <laughs> Jesus. I didn't want to get hard. <laughs> oh, right. I'm scared, man. <laughs> I was afraid, man. Uh, Damn. Is it true that you have a human hair collection from the Jerry Springer show? Yeah, so. <laughs> Are you trying to make a wig out of it? Like, what you no, like it was so stupid, stuff. man. Like, So women would always fight, and they'd be pulling each other's hair out. Hilarious. So one day, <laughs> I took the strand of hair, and I just wrapped it up in a little tiny ball. Yeah. Well, then after that, Every time there was a fight, I would add that hair to the ball. <laughs> well, it got to be the size of like a bowling ball after, you know, like 10 years, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. And it was so gross, man. You, know, you <laughs> think about all this hair, and it was all different colors, and, you know, it was a lot of probably wig hair in there. And uh, I used to just keep, we had three chairs. It was Jerry, the executive producer, and me, and then my wife, so there was four chairs. And right behind my chair was in the corner, and I would just throw this human ball of hair back there, and, and then I got my own show, so I don't even know what happened to that big ball of hair. Oh, oh wow. I hope nobody <laughs> kept it. <laughs> Do you remember the first time the audience started chanting Steve, 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 and why? Like, like was I, that I, organic? Uh, yeah, it was organic, and I couldn't tell you when the first time it happened, but um, I remember, like, I, I do remember, like, I was coming up on stage a lot when the show shifted mm-hmm. and they started having the fights, and then I would sit in between the guests sometimes, you know, because it was just getting crazy. And I remember nobody knew who I was, so Jerry came up on stage and was like, you know, you're here a lot, and, you know, what's your name? And I said, Steve, and I think people just were like, Steve, you know, mm. back then. And, you know, it was crazy because in Chicago we had these great audiences. You know, we're right off Michigan Avenue and NBC Tower, and so the audience would be packed. It was like, it was like probably the Coliseum back with the Romans, you know, <laughs> feed the Christians to the lions because that's, that was kind of the atmosphere on the Springer Studios back then. You remember the first time you got recognized in the public? 
when you was like, wow, I'm, I'm a I I'm remember a walking out of the studio and the first time uh, a kid asked me for my autograph, because this was before cell phones, and you know, yeah. I'm sure a lot of your listeners can't even imagine it. There wasn't <laughs> no cell phones back then. But uh, he asked me for my autograph, and I said, dude, why would you want my autograph? You know, I was like, no. And he's like, no, please, you know. I said, okay, here you go. And, and that was kind of like the first time I'm like, man, I guess I'm a part of this show, you know. Absolutely. All of that led to... All of that had to lead to you getting your own show, though. Like, there had to be some producers yeah. back there like, yo, Steve is pretty, really popular. I, I, I don't know if that was the case. I think what really cemented it was when Jerry went on Dancing with the Stars. And, you know, because I was a big oh, part yeah. of the show. So when he went on Dancing with the Stars, they said, we can't shut the production of the show down. He'll probably be gone a week. You know, he's terrible. He'll get voted <laughs> off right away. Well, I... And back then, we we taped three days a week, and we would do two shows each day, so six shows a week. I did all six, and then they mis- they you know underestimated Jerry because audience loved Jerry, mm. and they kept voting him to stay on. So I think he was on six weeks. Well, I ended up doing thirty shows, and when those thirty shows aired, they rated it really well. Mm. So I don't think anybody was sitting around going, "Hey, let's give this guy a show." I think a lot of them looked at me like he's he's a cop. Who cares? And but when they when the when I did all those shows and they rated well, then somebody said, "Hey, let's give this guy shows on Monday." So Jerry would tape Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. He'd come in do Tuesday, Wednesday. I would do Monday shows. And then after that, I got a phone call and said, "Hey, we're giving you your own show." Wow. Well, I hope that person got a raise. Damn it! I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't give me one. They barely paid me a little more than what I was making on the Springer show. I was like, "This is crazy, man!" Mm-hmm. Like. First, the first offer was less than what I was making. So I don't think anybody even knew what I was making on Spurrier. Mm. And so I was like, that's less than what I'm making now. And I'm going to make less. I said, no, I didn't, you know. So they gave me a little more. So yeah, that first year was kind of rough. Mm. You, you said you and Jerry used to talk politics. So being that this is an election year, is that something that we might see in the 17th season? Of season? No, not on my not show. Enough? No, we've okay. never talked politics on the yeah. show. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, when you're on the air so long because people – like when I'll come September, I'll be doing the big media, you know, for mm-hmm. season 18. And everybody will say, oh, you know, is there any changes coming up for the season? And the answer is no. Mm-hmm. Because when you've been on this long, people tune in, they expect a certain show, lie right, detector right. test, the DNA test. So you're not going to fool. Like people always said to me, well, why does Maury do DNA every day? I go, because people watch. That, yeah. Well, <laughs> That's the simple as that. Change. Like, you, yeah. you know, you don't mess around with it. I was going to ask, with you being an ex-police officer, what do you think about how the world is taking towards cops now? Like, things have changed, right? Now, with, with bail reform, you know, criminals are getting out faster. Uh, it feels like cops are scared now to do anything because everything's on camera. Well, when you, when they, when I think in New York, then they take away their uh, immunity? Mm-hmm. Like, you can be personally sued, right? Yeah. It's yeah, just, I mean, you know, we didn't have that when I was a cop. And I mean, who's going to jeopardize, you know, their financial well-being to, you know, listen, I think, I'll, I'll put it this way. When I was coming out of the Marines in 1989, I wanted to be a cop, just like my dad. And it was a good job, you know, like you got pension, benefits, all this stuff. If I was coming out of the Marines today, I would never take that job, not in mm. a million years. So, I mean, I, I think policemen really are, it's not a good job. You, you know, you fight all the time, and like you said, you make arrests, and people are back out on the streets, especially here in New York. And Chicago's the same way, so, you know, yeah, uh, it's not a good job. Do you have a, a, a timetable on when you want the show to run its course? Uh, I love doing the show, and, I, you know, I'm all... Well, I'm only 60. God, I was 30 when I started on TV. Oh, but like, I don't, I, yeah, yeah, I don't okay. think 60 is old. Yeah, it is. Come on, man. No. Nah. When you say 60, see, you don't think it's old because you're not there yet. When you become 60, it sounds old and it is old, you know. Mm-hmm. But so the answer to your question is um, I love doing the show. Uh, I enjoy it. It provides me with a great life. So I don't, I'm never going to say I'm going to quit. Um, but, you know, TV's changing. It's, it's difficult and it's tough now you know uh and now they're exploring all these different avenues to bring revenue into the show um but i would definitely like to hit 20 i'm at 17 i'm going to season 18 Mm -hmm. nice round number Mm -hmm. 20 um if it would go longer i guess i would do it uh you know because i just finished taping last wednesday and now i won't go back to work until last week in august 
So I get oh, a nice wow. break. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. 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 I, I do have one last question. I, I look at Dr. Phil, right? And people say Dr. Phil went from fixing relationship problems to focusing on fixing America's problems. Like we saw him at the border and things like that. What do you, what do you think of that? I, uh, you know, it's funny you say that because I just saw him on The View mm-hmm. talking about how COVID affected kids. Yep, yep, yep. And the women on The View were like, oh, well, you know, we saved kids from, you know, getting COVID. And he's like, hey, man, kids weren't getting COVID anyway. That's right. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, and we really hurt our children by not having them in school. And he made a great point when I never even thought about kids that were in bad situations and now... We weren't following up on them like kids that were being molested or abused at home. Mm-hmm. All these, you know, mm-hmm. uh, agencies that were responsible for that were mm-hmm. sending them into the home, being constantly with the abuser. And so I thought he made a really wonderful point. And uh, so I think Dr. Phil is, you know, he, well, first of all, he's a very educated guy, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think he's a very smart guy. So I just thought that was really a great point. And he was making some really good points about how kids. We've hurt them with their development. Uh, teen suicides, you know, just went through the roof with yeah. this pandemic. Because I, I don't know how you guys reacted to it, but, you know, just being home all the time in the same spot, not mm-hmm. going out, everybody fearful, that's tough on your psyche, yeah. you know. Um, and so, like, with kids where they weren't uh, getting COVID, they weren't really, you know, a, a risk, we should have been sending them back to school and, and getting out there and socializing and yeah. everything else. So I, I had a lot of respect for uh, Dr. Phil for doing that. And listen, he he has the platform where he can make that change. I don't have that platform. You don't? You don't think no, so? No, not not with my show. Um, you know, and, and Dr. Phil, I, I, I think it's a good move for him. And mm-hmm. I, I, I enjoy listening to him. You don't think they would accept something like that from you if you decided to? Not something? on my show. I'd have with to have a else. I'd have to yeah. have a different platform other than my show. My show, my fans, I don't think would be down for yeah, it. Yeah, you have a very set formula. Yeah, which yeah and I, you know, and, people yeah. like it, and I just, yeah. I don't, it wouldn't be good. Mm-hmm. Well, clearly it works, man. 17 right. seasons. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank That's you. right. The Steve Wilco Show in his 17th season, and thank you for joining us again. One second. Um, what is your skin regimen? You do not look like a six-year-old white man. <laughs> you do not. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, just, I, I, I shave. I don't do any, like, you know, my old publicist, Gary Rosen, he'd c- give me all these skincare products and yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. And I they're probably all shoved in my drawer in my bathroom, never touched or broken. And my wife, like, she's like, damn it, your skin's so beautiful. Right. Like, you don't do anything? I don't do anything. Okay. Yeah. That's you aging awesome. like a black person. Yeah, that's what I'm like. Damn. Steve Wilkos. Yes. Well, I'm not the whitest guy in the world either. It's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's the Breakfast Club. Good Thank morning. Thank you. Wake that ass up. Early in the morning. The Breakfast Club.